uh, we are going to have a health talk. I want to talk about epigenetics. How many of us have yet anything about epigenetics? Epigenetics. Anyone? Epigenetics. No one. Uh, okay. So when you are looking at uh, epigenetics, it is how our external factors, environmental factors, um, our diet, our nutrition, our lifestyle, how they influence expression of our genes. We, we grew up knowing that what you have, your genetic makeup is who you are, right? So you have your genetic makeup, that's your nature as a person. Like, um, so that theory has long been dismissed because we have seen how um, your genetic makeup can be affected or influenced by your lifestyle and it will change your genetic expression. So there are certain diseases that are, okay, maybe let me not go into that. Um, we, when you're looking at causes of disease, we have four main categories. We have heredity, which contributes about 10% of the diseases that we have. We have another 10% which comes from the healthcare system, which is your absence or presence of a functional healthcare system. You will find certain countries which will never have cholera because they have a functional uh, healthcare. They, they, you have find countries which have eradicated diseases um, that are people get immunized against, right? So you, you will find that we, we, we can have certain, like those, uh, the killer diseases that we find on our baby cards, certain countries have long since eradicated those diseases because they have a functional healthcare system and people get vaccinated and all that. And 20% comes from disease, where you are, uh, I'm sorry, comes from environment. The environment, Oh, I had used the cholera example. In an environment where you are living, the surroundings, uh, maybe presence of um, good sanitation. So you find, like, yeah, the example that I used about cholera, you find that there are certain neighborhoods that are endemic to cholera. Like, cholera is always there because they have poor sanitation. Um, water issues, all those things. And you can get to issues of internal environment which you create in your own house, in your own home. Um, some people will not open their windows. Some people will not uh, make their beds. They don't spread their beds. Some people don't bath that often. Some people do not have good hygienic practices. Um, and the food that you, have put, that you have stored in your house, you have created an internal environment for yourself. So in, environment contributes 20%. And then, so that's 20 from environment, 10 from the healthcare system, and 10 from the heredity. And then 60% comes from lifestyle, which are the choices where you are looking at your diet, your alcohol intake, uh, physical activity, or lack of physical activity, tobacco smoking, issues of stress management, so you have, you, you have 60% of the diseases that we have uh, come from our lifestyle. So now, I want now to go to the subject of epigenetics where I said, we, you have your nature, nature is an N-A-T-U-R-E, like your genetic makeup, that's your nature. But we have nature, how you are naturing these genes to be expressed, maturing as an N-U, N-U-R-T-U-R-E. So nature versus nature. Nature is your lifestyle. So we have, so we have genes on our, um, your genetic makeup, your DNA will not change, but your lifestyle will influence how your DNA is expressed. So to, when I'm speaking to young people, you, you have the capacity to change 
how your DNA is expressed. And this will, can affect three or four generations after you. And it may then sound like it's a genetic disease when it's not, because your DNA sequencing is not showing that this is a genetic disease, but it's because you have changed how your genes are expressed with your lifestyle. So there are things that change how your genes are expressed. For example, let me talk about um, alcohol intake. Alcohol intake will affect how your genes are expressed. Alcohol intake will even, it will affect your brain. When, when we get to the, um, the alcohol intake disorder, you will, you will affect expression of your genes to the extent that even your, if you are a woman, the babies that you are going to give birth to will have an alcohol abuse disorder because of how your genes have been expressed. If you are a guy, so you, you are going to affect, you are going to have a generation of people who drink alcohol as if it's, it was a genetic problem, but it's because of you are the ones who exposed your genes to that. We all have switches, like uh, let me call them switches in our, um, in our borders, like the way you are turning on and off the light. So you are turning on and off diseases. You, your, your lifestyle has the capacity to turn on genes that cause disease. So on your genes, on your, let me just uh, use an example, like you know our shoelaces, our shoelaces at the end, there's that coating, right, which, um, avoids the shoeless to fray. Now your, your lifestyle will open this, will open this, will remove this plastic and expose these genes that can make you sick. We often say that it is your lifestyle which pulls the trigger. You may have genes which are loaded with disease, but that does not necessarily mean that you have uh, the breast cancer gene, so it's automatic that you're going to get breast cancer. It's not as automatic. It's your lifestyle, which is going to turn on this breast cancer. You have, you may have, even you don't have the breast cancer gene, but you are now going on to turn certain genes that will cause breast cancer. You do not have. So this comes, especially, particularly when uh, God blesses you, you get married, and God blesses you, you, op you opens your, wo your womb, you become pregnant. When you are pregnant, let's say you are pregnant with a female fetus. You are a woman, you are pregnant with a female fetus. What you are eating, your nutrition, you have a high sugar diet, you have a high alcohol intake, low vegetable intake. It will turn on genes for disease in you. And then it's going to turn on genes for disease in your fetus. And this fetus, around 20 weeks, she's already developing ovaries, right? And in those ovaries, there are eggs which start to develop when you're 20 weeks pregnant. So when you're turning on these genes because of your bad lifestyle, you're turning on genes on yourself, on your baby girl, and on the eggs that are in your ovaries, on your 20-week fetus. So now your lifestyle is affecting yourself, your baby, and the eggs which are in your, this fetus. So you've already affected generations. So when you read the Bible, when God says, uh, generations, even when it comes to disease, and it's, it's it, you, you stand on, you become the matriarch of disease in your lineage, okay. This, when you're a guy, you have high intake of bride meat. You have high intake of um, grilled meats. So grilled, grilled meats will, okay, you'll have what we call your uh, polyphenolic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are carcinogens. 
So they will turn on, on your sperm. They will affect, number one, sperm maturation. And then they are going to affect sperm motility. So you are a guy, you have a life cell of high meat intake. You don't take enough vegetables. You don't sleep enough. So you are affecting your sperms. Now you get married. You have uh, low sperm maturation. Your sperm has low motility. Or even if you have, you, you have good sperm count, but you have turned on genes that cause disease. So you are affecting your future generations by your lifestyle. So if you are careless with your lifestyle right now, it's not going to end only with you. It's going to affect the future. Okay. So well, I, I do not have enough time. When you are looking at um, prostate cancer, prostate cancer usually comes when people are above 40. I, in fact, the onset age for prostate cancer used to be around 60, but it has gone down because of lifestyle. One of the lifestyle factors is uh, sleeping late. If you are not sleeping early enough, you watch series, you watch whatever, movies up to 1, 2 p.m. That's your lifestyle. You are turning on 700 genes which are responsible for prostate cancer. So now, you have a lifestyle which is responsible. You know, I've always said, when we make choices, choices come with consequences. You don't choose the consequences, but consequences are part of the what? The package. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the consequence was that they, they were chugged out of the garden. Was it God's will that Adam and Eve would, uh, God drove them out of the Garden of Eden? Was that God's will? It was not God's will. It was what? A consequence of their choice. So sometimes when you're looking at uh, the high morbidity and mortality from lifestyle diseases, we can't as ascribe that to God's will when these are clearly our lifestyle choices. We can't say when you get diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is a lifestyle disease for type 2. So we have type 1 and type 2. Type 2 uh, accounts for about 90 to 95% of the people who get type 2 diabetes. And it comes in adulthood. It's usually, it's mainly lifestyle. So it's either you've turned on the genes that bring diabetes mellitus to you um, due to your lifestyle, maybe you, are, you do not have physical activity, you are obese, you have high fat intake, you have uh, low fiber intake. Now, so when you are now diabetes, uh, you're now a diabetic, we can't say that is, it's God's will because you yourself, you tend on the gene for yourself. With your lifestyle. So it is important as young people, the decisions that we make on the, our lifestyle choices, particularly when, com when it comes to your diet, when it comes to physical activity, when it comes to alcohol intake, when it comes to, to tobacco intake and uh, substance abuse. All these things, they have a huge bearing on how you are going to turn on and off genes that are responsible for disease in you, and not only in you, in the future generations which God will bless you with. So may we make decisions that are wise when it comes, some people will say, no, this is my life, I eat what I want, I have the right to be wrong. Yes, people fight for the right to be wrong. It's okay, you may want that right to be wrong and eat whatever you want, drink whatever you want, take whatever substance you want. But let's remember our bodies are the temple of the Lord. And we should, as um, Romans 12 in closing, Romans, um, where, where we say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is a an act of worship, taking care of your body, making the right choices on the type of food that you're eating. You're looking at a high fiber 
diet, a whole food, uh, whole foods plant-based diet is the ideal diet for us because of all the factors, I can't go in on the details of how a whole foods plant-based diet will help you in terms of epigenetics, how it turns off these certain genes, how it turns on uh, genes that will protect you. So it's a whole area. But a whole foods plant-based diet will help you, is protective. When you are sleeping enough hours, it protects you. When you are limiting sugary beverages, it protects you, it protects your future generations that are going to come out of you. When you reduce your meat intake, uh, or when you eliminate your meat, meat intake or fat from your diet, you are protecting yourself. And it's an act of worship, like what Romans 12 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. When you are taking care of your body, making healthy choices, you are making your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto the Lord is an act of worship. May God bless us. I, I greet the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and soon coming Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. How many of us are happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 11, John chapter 11, John chapter 11, we start reading from verse 1, John chapter 11, the Bible reads, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. The sisters therefore sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. The next few minutes, we just want to look at this few verses in the book of John. The Bible says Lazarus is sick. His two sisters send a message to Jesus telling Jesus that Lord, the one you love is very sick. Lazarus is sick. His sisters send a message to Jesus to tell him that the one you love is very sick. If you continue reading in the passage, you will discover the Bible says Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus loved this family, but Lazarus felt sick. This brings me to my first point, that even those that Jesus loved are not exempted from pain and suffering. You, you, I don't know. Even those he loves, they are not exempted from diseases and suffering. Even those that he loved suffer. Even those that he love lose their jobs. Even those that he love bury their loved ones. Even those that he love go through trials and tribulations. So don't think when you go through trials and tribulations, God does not love you. Don't think when you lose your loved ones, God does not care. Even those he loves are not exempted from trials and tribulation. And the Bible says... They, they, they send a message to Jesus to tell him that the one you love is very sick. Now, brothers and sisters, Mary and Martha want Jesus to come to Bethany and heal Lazarus. 
They believe that if Jesus shows up in Bethany, he would heal Lazarus. That they want him to come. That's why when you continue reading in the story, when Jesus shows up, they say to him, Lord, if you had been here, my bro our brother would not have died. So they wanted Jesus to come to Bethany because they believed that if Jesus showed up, Jesus would be able to heal their brother Lazarus. But these are followers of Jesus Christ. These are people who had been with the Jesus Christ. These are people who, who had followed Jesus Christ. Now, if you read in the book of Matthew chapter 8, there's a story in the book of Matthew chapter 8, the story of the centurion. His servant is sick. He goes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, Lord, my servant is sick. And Jesus says to the servant, I will come to your house and deal with your servant. But the centurion says to Jesus, I'm not a man, I'm not a man deserving to have you under my roof. He says to Jesus, just say a word and I believe that my servant will be healed. I don't know if you're getting this thing, brothers and sisters. Mary and Martha want Jesus to come. But the centurion believed that Jesus, even the disciples knew that Jesus could heal from a distance. But Mary and Martha, you see, Mary and Martha were desperate. You see, desperation makes you forget what God is capable of. Desperation makes you forget what God cannot do, what, what God can do. You see, Mary and Martha were ignorant of the power of God. And then that, 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 that happens with us as well. When we are desperate, that's why I, I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true, that, 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 that here in Zimbabwe, they say this happens in Zimbabwe, where people chop up, chop up their toes because they want to be successful. <laughs> that they want to be successful. They are desperate. They have been hungry for so long. And when this opportunity comes, they are willing to chop off their toes. Desperation makes you forget what God is capable of. Ignorant of the power of God. God could heal from a distance, but these girls want him to come under their roof. They do not say to, 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 to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is very sick. But we believe that even where you are, you can just say a word and our brother will be healed. Ignorant. Of the power of God. I'm reminded of a story. A story is told. It happened in Canada. This young man, he's desperate as well. So he goes, he robs a, a, a bank. He robs the bank of a thousand dollars. He robs the bank of a thousand dollars. But because he was a foolish young man, he was caught. And the, the police officers asked him to hand over the weapon he had used to rob that bank. He handed it over. The officers looked at the weapon. It was a powerful weapon. The weapon was worth about $10,000. This foolish young man robs a bank of $1,000 with a weapon worth $10,000. See, the problem with this young man, he did not know what he had in his hands. If he knew what he had in his hands, he would not have, so he would not have robbed the bank. And that's the problem that we have as well. We are ignorant of the power of God. And because we are ignorant of the power of God, when we are desperate, we think Dubai will sort it out. Ignorant of the power of God. Haven't you read in your word that our God is capable? He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we ask or imagine. Never be ignorant of the power of God. Haven't you read in your word that what is impossible with man is possible with God? Haven't you read in your word that this same God is the same man that spoke things into existence? In the beginning, he spoke and things happened the way he had spoke them into existence. Haven't you read? Don't let desperation control you. Ignorant of the power of God. Oh, my brothers and sisters, today I want to let you know that there is nothing that God cannot do. But when we let desperation control us, we will do the things that the people of the world are doing. So they send the message to Jesus, telling him that the one you love is very sick. That's the message they send to Jesus. I need to close this thing now. Listen to the message they send to Jesus. No, no, it is Lazarus who is sick. But it's not Lazarus who sends the message. It's Lazarus who needs to see Jesus. But it's not Lazarus who sends the message. It is the sisters who send the message. You see, Lazarus is too sick to send the message. He's too weak to send the message. So the sisters step in 
and sent the message on his behalf. My prayer is that the church may have more Marys and Marthas. Because if the church has more Marys and Marthas, when Lazarus is too sick, Mary and Martha will step in. When Lazarus is too drunk, Mary and Martha will not judge him. But Mary and Martha will find a quiet place somewhere and go down on your, their knees and say, Master Creator, the one you love is very sick. <laughs> see, 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 see when, you, when you find your elder or your church pastor in a nightclub doing some funny business there, before you can tell the church about it, find a quiet place somewhere, go down on your knees and say, Lord, the one you love, is very sick. Our church needs more Marys and Marthas, people that will pray when Lazarus cannot pray for himself. Ah, there's a story. I think it's in the book of Mark chapter 2. The brother is sick. The Bible says his friends carry him to Jesus. When they get to the place that Jesus was preaching in, the place is packed. They do not do what I would have done in that situation. I would have looked at my friend and said to him, my brother, we have tried. The man is busy. The room is full. We tried. Now we are taking you back home. We'll continue praying for you. But that's not what the friends did. The Bibles, they did not give up on their friend. The Bible says they went up to the roof. It's not their building, but because they care about their friend. They go up to the roof. They opened that thing. They lowered their sick friend. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick man, your sins have been forgiven. It's not the faith of the sick man that got him healed, but it was the faith of the friends. Ah, we need more friends like that. Friends that will not carry us to nightclubs, but friends that will carry us to the cross. Friends that will not carry us to strip clubs, but friends that will carry us to where Jesus is. My prayer is that you may be that friend to somebody. You may be that friend to one another. Carry one another to the cross. That when Lazarus cannot pray for himself, Mary and Martha may jump in and pray for Lazarus. Let me close it this way. Listen to the message they send. They say, Lord, the one you love is sick. You missed it. I do not know how. Let me try it again. Listen to the message. They say, they say Lord, the one you love is very sick. Now, they do not say, Lord, the one who loves you is sick. They say, Lord, the one you love is very sick. A Christian believer, faithful man, was sick. The saints gathered at his house to pray for him. And the brother that was praying says, Lord, you know how much he loves you. After praying, the sick man says to the brother that was praying, he says to him, I know you meant well, but never pray like that. Because it is, I don't want my recovery. My recovery will not come based on my love for him. But my recovery will come based on his love for me. Ah, you are not with me, brothers and sisters. Mary and Martha, when they send the message, they say, Lord, the one you love is very sick. They do not say the one who loves you is sick. You see, our love for God is not worth mentioning. But his love for us can never be enough spoken of. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Our love for the man is not worth mentioning. But his love for us can never be enough spoken. And this is real love. That while we were yet sinners, while we were messed up, while we were doing wrong, Christ died for us because our love for the man is not worth mentioning, but his love for us can never be enough spoken of. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God, that we should be called messed up as we are, filthy as we are, that we should be called the children of God, and that's what we are. Ah, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor things present, nor things to come, nor things above, nor things below, shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our love for the man is not worth mentioning, but his love for us can never be enough spoken of. That's why the singer then says, the songwriter then says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He knew me and yet he loved me. Another one then says he could have called 10,000 angels but he died alone for you and for me. It's not the nails that held him to the tree but it is his love for humanity that made him to stay on the tree. 
So today, this, today, this afternoon, I just stopped by to remind us that we are loved. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I just want to remind someone here today that we, you, we are loved. Our God's loved us so much that he sent, emptied heaven, sent his only son to die on the cross for us. Our love for the man is not worth mentioning, but his love for us can never be enough spoken of. I want to pray with someone today. I want to pray with someone today. You, you know you've done some, some, some terrible things. You know you've messed up. You've, you know you've gone out of the way. But today you just want to make things right with God. And I want to let you know like the prodigal son, when he made his way home, when his father saw him coming, the father never rejected the son. The father accepted him. So it doesn't matter how messed up you are. It doesn't matter how filthy you are. He promises in Revelation chapter 3 that if you open the door, he will come in and dine with you. So I don't know what your story is. I don't know how messed up you are. But I want to let you know today that if you open, he's coming in. So are you here today? Are you here today? Pastor Ernesto will pray for us. Are you here today? And you're saying, Lord, I'm opening this door. And I'm letting you in. If you're here and you want to let him in, we will stand and we will pray together. If you're here. All right. Let's pray. Dear God, we stand in your presence because we are in desperate need of your presence. We open up our hearts, Lord. Will you reign supreme in our lives right now. Some of us here, Lord, have not fully decided to follow you. Some of us here are still in the valley of decision. We are still uh, procrastinating the decision to fully surrender to your lordship. Now, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the spoken word, we plead that the spirit of the living God will move and touch each heart under this roof in the name of Jesus. Bless our hearts now as we give you our souls. In Christ's name we plead. Amen.